starting up the record. Sorry about that, guys. We're going to, the recording starts now. Tonight's episode is also being recorded. So if you missed something, you can go back and rewatch on our Right America YouTube channel, which has its link right on the front page at Birds Books. And I've also put it in the chat. We're now hosting all of our episodes on Zoom, so all the recordings will reside on YouTube. Many of the earlier episodes are there already, and we will place this one there while I continue to move the earlier ones over. Tonight, we're sorry to say that Elaine Pagels was not able to join us. We congratulate her on her upcoming wedding day this Friday, but we do have a special episode tonight with Bill Nariccio and Roger Rosenblatt, and we're very excited about that. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Bill Nariccio. William Memo Nariccio, a cultural studies professor from Laredo, Texas, and the director of San Diego State University Press, began his career as a Latin Americanist focused on 20th century fiction by Carlos Fuentes, Rosario Castellanos, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. From his first assistant professorship, professorship at the University of Connecticut, he moved to San Diego State University in 1991, where he, his work has expanded into critical studies of mass culture, streaming media, and Latinx fiction. With a BA in English from UT Austin and a PhD in comparative literature from Cornell University, Derecio presently directs the MALS Cultural Studies MA at San Diego State University. His latest book co-authored with Frederick Luis Aldama, Talking Hashtag Brown TV, Latinas and Latinos on Screen, appeared in January from 2020 from the Ohio State University Press. His best known work, Text Mex, S Seductive Hallucinations of the Mexican in America, University of Texas Press, 2020, 20, 2007. Please welcome to the screen, Bill Mauricio. Let me grab you, Bill. All right. I'm so happy uh, to be part of, of, of this program. I saw that next week, one of my uh, graduate student mentors, uh, Henry Louis Gates is gonna be, be on the show. And I'm just, you know, I'm on, uh, honor, honored to be here. I wanted to begin with uh, something that actually Roger wrote uh, that I was reading off the webpage for the Right America uh, series. And he says that the nation is injured we hope to contribute to its healing. And I think that's, that's beautiful. That is the power uh, of great writers to, to have an impact on a national consciousness. And I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to share my writing uh, with you all today. So I'm gonna begin actually by reading from uh, the book you mentioned, uh, Tex-Mex, Seductive Hallucinations of the Mexican in America. And yes, if you can make that out, that's a tortilla on the front cover, me and Lisa Tremaine, what the designer for UT Press went back and forth many times uh, arguing about the cover. Um, all right. I'm reading from the beginning of the book where I talk about the, the birth of Mexican stereotypes. Mexicans are funny things, Mexican-Americans in American mass culture. Uh, we're either ignored to the point of being invisible or we're seized upon and used as uh, tools or as uh, whipping boys, uh, as our last president uh, indeed did, whipping up fires of national uh, passion, uh, fear of the other that uh, I wanted to attack in my book. I, I'm not one of these professors who just scholarly in a measured way um, assesses the situation. Uh, I believe that as, as teachers and as writers, we, we've got to intervene. And when we see something's wrong, jump right in. Postcards and war. The foundation for Hollywood style Mexicans had been built up in the first two decades of the 20th century. And it was to have a, de determ uh, a huge impact on the artistic conjuring of Speedy Gonzalez and all the other Mexicans you might recognize from American pop culture. The said foundation had been laid in the early and remarkably popular Greaser film series, 
Some titles of note include The Mexican's Revenge, 1909, The Mexican's Jealousy, 1910, Chiquita the Dancer from 1912, The Girl and the Greaser, 1913, The Greaser's Revenge, 1914, and the especially sadistic The Cowboy's Baby uh, from 1910, in which a quote unquote greaser tosses the hero's child into a river. The dates of the production of these films have an intrigue of their own. And in Tex-Mex, I look at how the birth of uh, the explosion of Mexican stereotypes actually occurred coincidental with the explosion of movie houses, right? Vaudeville was dying. Circuses were shrinking. Everywhere across America, motion picture houses were opening. And what they, what they were showing were short films, like these greaser films, and uh, uh, newsreels. And the newsreels, of course, were documenting United States soldiers in uh, Mexico with uh, hunting Pancho Villa. So you have this weird coincidence of technology and uh, the history of st stereotypes. Um, and, and, and what's weird is that Mexicans were very much on the foreground of, of the American imagination at that time. Much of this book was written, uh, it took 16 years to write Tex-Mex and uh, select portions of the books, uh, book appear in italics, uh, probably some William Faulkner uh, influence on me, uh, but the passages in the book that are in italics were written at like three or four in the morning when I would wake up to work on the book and I hadn't even thought, I hadn't had any coffee, hadn't even thought about what I was going to do that morning. And so they, they come across as, as kind of, I don't know, poetry. The Tex-Mex rant, a prayer for and against pendejo mannequins. The Tex-Mex is a tattoo. It's a mark on the body of America it likes to look at. And it has a right to look at it to be entertained by it, to laugh at it, and to loathe it. It made it. It put it there. These stereotypes are the sum total of its demented vision. And the Tex-Mex tattoo is clever. It's, it's almost sentient, always salaciously seductive, moving with the dynamics of what Freud called hysterical identification. That is, it elicits, quote, sympathy intensified to the point of reproduction. And that's what we don't realize about stereotypes. We need them to communicate. That repetition is, is, elicits a, a sympathy or a hatred uh, in, that is intensified to the, to the point of reproduction. So these stereotyped visions of Mexicans, these demented vision haunts all, it, it influences all. It, it, it leaves the taint of its stain here and there to haunt, perhaps most of all, us, the Mexican-Americans, the Chicanas, the Chicanos, the, now the Chicanexers, right? We Latinos who got to wear that stereotype like a sandwich board, scrawled with crude epithets, for all to see and wonder at. Or better yet, like a disguise that won't come off, some aberrant child of Halloween. Latino stereotypes are the mask that can't be pried away, the fabric that becomes skin. Just a few more selections. I have uh, just a few more minutes. The most popular part of my book, Tex-Mex, and it was a weird thing. It was a quote unquote bestseller because it sold more than 100 copies for an English professor. Um, it's actually sold close to 8,000 copies, which, you know, makes me kind of a, I don't know, Stephen King of ac academics, right? Um, but the chapter that really caught fire was the backstory on Speedy Gonzalez, uh, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, ubiquitous Mexican rat. 
And so I'll just give a little, a little taste from, from, from that section. Speedy Gonzalez, from the 50s and the early 60s and on to the present day, this ubiquitous Latino mouse has mesmerized cinema devotees and television viewers the world over. Witty, savvy, and fast, Gonzalez, whose business card proclaims him the fastest mouse in all Mexico, served as a comic celebrity in legions of Warner Brothers animated adventures with a supporting cast of by turns silly, by turns pathetic and filthy, furry and feathered friends. As an English speaking child of Mexican descent living in Laredo, Texas, I laugh convulsively at the devil may care exploits of Speedy and his retinue of lazy shiftless cohorts who are in the words of the gringo pussy gato Sylvester, nothing but miserable little sneaking crooked cheese thieves. In the Pied Piper of Guadalupe, Sylvester adds more predictable abuse. That's all you can do is run, 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 you cowardly little cheese thieves. Predictable? Yeah, predictable, in that it did not take a terrible stretch of the imagination by the mid-1950s for U.S. moviegoers to conjure the image of a Mexican as a thief. Decades-long territorial disputes and wars with our southern neighbor helped ensure that this was the case. I'm checking the time. Okay. I have one last little piece I'm going to read. It's from a book I co-wrote with uh, my amazing co-author who's not here today, Frederick Aldama. It's called Talking Brown TV, Talking Hashtag Brown TV. That hashtag, oh my God, for indexers, it just it, it made, made our life uh, a nightmare. But in Talking Brown TV, I, we tried to expand, or I tried to expand on what I tried to do with Tex-Mex. I mean, following on what, uh, Trump and his his retinue of, of of predictable thieves had done to Mexicans in American mass culture. I felt that it was it, it, it was pertinent for those of us who were Chicano, who were Mexican American, and happened not to be rapists, to hold forth and articulate on uh, the damage that popular uh, stereotypes had on. Uh, the psychology of, of our consciousness. And so this, this last piece, piece, this is my last piece, I promise, um, is, is me talking about um, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and Mexicans on streaming media. What really gets me is that we're living and breathing and writing now in the golden age of television. Forget uh, Edgar R. Murrow or Cronkite. It's Matt Weiner, Weiner with The Sopranos and Mad Men and, and, and Vince Gilligan with Breaking Bad and now Better Call Saul. They represent the acme, the apex, the high summit of narrative power and ubiquity. Oh, this right now. And here again, the Mexicans we meet in these shows are scary. They're horrible. They're ridiculous as all get out. Uh, there's a kind of East Coast Latinx gravity in force here with regard to casting, by which I mean a kind of East Coast Latinx dominance, owing to the Puerto Rican density of New York City and the Cuban American hegemony in Miami, Florida. Two of the stars on Breaking Bad and, can you mute that person? Please, thank you. Um, by which I mean a kind of um, two of the star villains on Breaking Bad, ostensibly Mexican and better call Saul, are retreads from Brian De Palma's 1983 Scarface. Stephen Bauer, who played Manny Rivera to Italian American Al Pacino's Cuban Tony Montana, is Don Eladio, a major Mexican cartel boss on Breaking Bad. Uh, Bauer, who was born Esteban Ernesto Echevarria Sampson in Havana, Cuba, is at least a Cuban Cuban American, albeit he's playing a, 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 a Colombian in Scarface. The second guy yeah, is a method actor with serious training chops, Mark Margolis, who played Alberto the Shadow in Scarface, 
and takes the role of the nefarious Hector Salamanca in Breaking Bad. It's hilarious that Margolis plays the better Mexican than Bauer, whose version of Spanish makes my Spanish, and I'm a recovering English dominant pocho, seem like I was trained at the Real Academia Española. So thank you very much Real Madrid. for giving me uh, the time to share my writing with you. Thanks, Alice. Sorry about the interruption, Bill. I'm trying to find out who that is because they burst in on it. So I very much appreciate your reading. Um, our next speaker is Roger Rosenblatt. Roger Rosenblatt, whose work has been published in 14 languages, is the author of five New York Times notable books of the year and four Times bestsellers. His honors include a Fulbright Scholarship, the 2015 Kenyan Review Literary Life Achievement Award, seven honorary doctorates, two George Polk Awards, the Peabody and the Emmy. Kirkus Review said Rogers, quote, has excelled in nearly every literary form, close quote. UPI called him a national treasure. We agree. Cataract Blues, his new book will be out this fall. Please welcome, please welcome to the screen. Roger, I need to find out who that is making the noise so that you're not interrupted. So hang on. Roger, you're welcome to read now. Oh, uh, can you can you, um, um, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Uh, that was wonderful, Bill. Um, just terrific stuff, rich stuff. Uh, Cataract uh, Blue, uh, by the way, um, among the various hats that Bill wears uh, so elegantly, is the, he's the publisher of San Diego State University Press, and I am blessed that uh, San Diego State University Press is publishing Cataract Blue. It's an unusual book. Uh, it's about three things that I try to put together, mystery, memory, and the color blue. The mystery is about events or things that are invisible or inaudible that are nonetheless real. The memory is of our daughter, Amy, who died 15 years ago and then never leaves my uh, thoughts. And she moves like a kind of angel through the book. And the color blue, which was revealed to me in all its brightness and um, uh, startling effects uh, after my cataract surgery. And somehow I try to put these three things together in, uh, I, it's like jazz, I play a little piano and it's, uh, I, I call it- Breaking uh, Bad, the best show of all time. I call it uh, running the keyboard, um, which is what I do just let the let section after section like movements and music try to have their effect. Uh, so the first part I'll read to you is actually my favorite part of the book, which is the dedication. And it's to our grandchildren, whom I call members of the band. So it's for members of the band. Jesse, our, the one, our one granddaughter. Jesse on vocals, Andrew on piano, Sam on clarinet, Ryan on trumpet, 
James on bass and Nate on drums. And I should tell you too that um, we were go, 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 go. absolutely as lucky as people can be because Jules Pfeiffer has agreed to illustrate this book. So Jules will do the cover and do the drawings inside the book. And we are naturally thrilled. I want to imagine, talk about an imaginative mind. So the epigraph and then the book. And what I want to know is, how do you like your blue-eyed boy? Uh, Buffalo Bill by Bill by E.E. E. Cummings. The human eye has rods, cells used for the perception of light, light, sorry, located at the outer edges of the retina, which allow us to see certain things more clearly out of the corners of our eyes. Colors, on the other hand, are perceived by cones at the center of the eye. In my odd way of seeing things, this means that my recent enthrallment with the color blue is the direct product of looking straight ahead, whereas the music of the blues plays at the far side of my mind. One is front and center, the other a ghost in the wings. When I see blue and feel blue, I'm using my whole eye. Charles Cole, my cataract surgeon, travels the world using his skills in the neediest places. In Africa, he tells me, the cataracts are so thick they form a black shield over the eyes. Villagers who suffer cataracts are legally blind and need to be led around by sighted people who hold one end of the stick as the blind person holds the other. The sighted person leads the blind one by gently pulling the stick in the desired direction. In the villages where Dr. Cole has worked his magic, there are piles of discarded sticks outside his clinic. These piles of sticks become accidental monuments that may remind villagers of the times when so many of them were helpless and helpful to one another. Such transactions speak for the beautiful gestures people are occasionally capable of. The blind man at the short end of the stick had to imagine everything around him, though the help he was given was real. He even imagined the appearance of his helper. By necessity, he saw inward where the vistas are illimitable. He was helpless, but he saw. Once cured and seeing, what did he think every day when he passed the village piles of sticks at the clinics? Relief and gratitude only, wonder at Western science, dazzlement at all he could newly see, or a pang of longing. Attempting to account for the fact that the ancient Irish soldiers lost every battle they got into, the poet Seamus O'Shiel, 1886 to 1954, posited that it was a secret music the soldiers heard, a sad, sweet plea for pity and for peace that distracted them from the fighting at hand. And so they lost, said O'Shiel, not because they lacked skill, strategy, stamina, courage, or the right weapons, but rather because they were sensitive to a spiritual sound a tune that beckoned them like muted sirens toward an inner peace by which they were simultaneously elevated and doomed. You might say better to win the battle than forfeit the music, but think what the music brought, a sad, sweet plea from pity and for peace, something civilizing and gentle and superior in the long run to merely one more victory in war, win one more war, I doubt that such receptivity comes naturally. One must cultivate an inner, an inner stillness capable of picking up the unplayed notes, the nothing that is there, as Wallace even said of snow. First there is nothing, then the nothing becomes everything. The Irish warriors surrendered not to the enemy, but to the mystery. Something will come to you. Richard Wilbur's assurance in waking to sleep like a queen who expects her chair to be there when she wishes to sit, like a general scouting the enemy who expects a pair of binoculars to be put in his hands when he needs them, something essential will come to you without being summoned. I tell that to my writing students when they bemoan dry spells, they don't believe it, and then they do. There are sticks out there waiting to be held by two. There is a secret music out there waiting to sweep through you like the notes of a jazz riff, trust me, Trust it, something will come to you. Beyond the drinking horn, beyond the colonel's stature, beneath 
the faint music and the lambent light beneath the Nessa, beneath every bird in Appalachia, including the bee hummingbird or Melisuga, beneath letters to a young poet, beneath the violet grass and the pale blue eye on the unorthodox blue dancer and the Countess Zablinka and her priceless blue tiara and the liquid air of your daughter's laughter, you feel the infrangible principle of conscience. And then out of the blue, blue, see, before the sun draws a copper line across the morning, everything is blue, a wash of blue, a vast blue bed sheet hung out to dry. The East River Drive at 96th Street, a denim blue, and the East River itself, a navy blue, and the embankment running beside it, Prussian blue, and the walking bridge at 106th Street, cerulean blue, and the apartment house and the city hospital behind them, all Egyptian blue. The RFK bridge, the triborough I grew up with, Matisse blue, the water tank of Virgin Mary, a Virgin Mary robes blue, the smokestacks behind the bridge, Zion and Robin's egg, Bird Island, originally Belmont and Utant Island, the smallest island in Manhattan, turquoise and sapphire, the, so the sky indigo stealing down to my shoes, go long blues, a young man's blue, a meter girl blue, a one on one in the playground blue, a couple of Irish whiskeys and a bar, sing your heart out in the snow. Fred Astaire, Rita Hayworth, Thelonious Monk, Bill Evans, Sarah Vaughan, Nancy Williams, Dave Brubeck, Blossom, Deary Blue. Oh. Mystery, memory, and the color blue. I discover the tune that connects them by running the keyboard, hunting packets in an inefficient method, strictly for amateurs, running the keyboard. I checked with my jazz piano teacher, Matt, if there was such a phrase in jazz, he said, no, that I made it up. So I made it up, but you get the drift, it's drift. Your hand moves up and down the keys, hitting the right note and then better hitting the wrong note. Whereupon you play another wrong note and then another to make a tune of the mistakes like other things in life, like life itself. Here we may, here we may find a new tune together, composed of mystery, memory, and the color blue. Who knows? More like a presence than an injury now after these 15 years, a presence of the absence, a presence, a presence made of absence. Death changes the dead too, imagine that. What the African villager sees, what the Irish soldier hears, like that, more like that. The pain transmogrifies from a cracked bone to a light, a song. She had her own language. Many children do. Hers was fortified by her insistence that what she was saying were real words, no matter how unusual they sounded. And it was her family's thick headedness that prevented us from understanding her. In the car, she would sing a rock and roll boat and a way, and a way boat. When we asked her what a way boat was, she said it was a wave boat. When we asked her what a wave boat was, she turned away annoyed and looked out the car window. Her pediatrician, John Roby, she referred to as rock and roll Roby. She also sang jolt, jolting up and down in my little red wagon. We asked if she meant jumping. She said, no, jolting. When we pressed her as to what jolting meant, she said, joltling. Joltling it was. We all joined in on joltling up and down in our little red wagon. When warm weather arrived, she sang a summer day is a cumber day. We knew better than to press her on the meaning of a cummer day, so a summer day was a cummer day. Sometimes she exercised poetic license, passing fields of a few grazing cows, and then a few more, she squealed and shouted with excitement. Cows, billions of them. The eye is the only part of the human body where the doctor may see a portion of the central nervous system, the optic nerve. So the idea that the eye is the window to the soul has something to it. What color is the soul? I can guess. Oh, say, can you see nothing? In traditional Chinese architecture, dugong is a structural element of interlocking wooden brackets. The pieces are fitted together by joinery alone without nails, glue, or fasteners. In the early dynasties, vast palaces and religious buildings were built this way. 
So look at them, one would never know that Dugan was supporting these structure because the arrangement of the wooden pieces depends on the absence of visible, tangible adhesive elements. In other words, the Dugan represents the there that is not there. Whereas Ted Hughes in an August Salmon describes the dying animal, his beauty bleeding invisibility from every lift of his gills as something visible, yet it's hard to look as it is literally in Annie Dillard's total eclipse of the sun. A loosened circle of evening sky was an abrupt black body out of nowhere. What we will not acknowledge as there might not be there, yet we always know something is there. For the essence of invisibility is something present that cannot or will not be seen, not something not there. Absence requires presence. The tune, all or nothing at all, all or nothing at all offers a, offers a choice between two somethings. I got a right to sing the blues. I have to write to swing the blues. I have the sight to see the blues. Once Dr. Cole removed my cataracts and removed what he called a foreign object in my right eye, as soon as it was gone. The color blue came, blue came busting into my life like an Atlantic City stripper. Brassy, noisy, a big spender. Call me Mr. Blue. I read an article claiming that blue is the world's favorite color. Every country lists blue as their favorite. It's hard to imagine a census taker asking that question, but I'll believe anything. Most people paint the walls of their homes blue. Picasso went through a stage in which he painted only in shades of blue. Yet blue is rarely in nature. There is the passiflora or passion flower, the blue, sorry, the blue iris, speaking of eyes, the blue delphinium and the nico blue hydrangea, Amy, our daughter, planted those along the driveway. As well as a few blue animals, such as the lazuli bunting with its bright blue cow. No animals except the blue whale, which really isn't blue, except the one hanging in the American Museum of Natural History. And the Irish carry blue terrier, which really is. The blue morpho butterfly gets its blue color from the rigid structure of its wings. The blue jay is interesting. Every feather of the bird is constructed of light scattering microscopic beads that are spaced in such a way that every color of light except blue light is canceled out. Sort of the way the sky selects blue, providing blue, proving that blue is a color that is there and not there. Raleigh's scattering of electromagnetic radiation into small wavelengths gives a blue hue to the sky, but as everybody knows, the sky is actually colorless. The same is true for the sea, where the wavelengths of absorbed light make the sea appear blue. Yet as one observes in very shallow water, the sea has no color at all. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean achromatic. Blue is an illusion, like the secret music or the world seen by the blind African villagers. A grand illusion, though, don't you think? Blue, blue is ocean, ocean waves and sea. Blue is the sadness in us. Blue is the sparkling water. The sadness in blue can never be changed, but you decide when to put it away. That poem is by James Solomon, Amy's son, when he was nine. James Solomon, age nine. Sometimes it flares. Sometimes it smolders as in a kiln, as in a mood. Blue coals in orange fires. It always starts with a mote in the eye, one of those foreign objects. This one's domestic. There is an echo. There is an ache. Then it passes. The recollection of a hat, the first pair of shoes, dank joints in a silo, a matinee of foot raised horses, a phrase or two or ten. A summer day is a comer day, and it passes. Out of sight, out of mind, then not. The pupil dilates. On Dr. Cole's chart, what is the small, what is the smallest letter you can read? A. And a tear wet face articulated by a moon ray on a snowfield in Vermont. Too cold, daddy. Little girl blue, head back, look up, look down, wide open. Then that's gone too, along with a figment of a blanket, the liquid air of her laughter, red boots, cartwheels in Logan Airport, 
and cows, billions of them. Blink once and hold it. This may sting a little. Thank you. So I see Bill. You see Bill, you me. need to unmute. I am unmuted, I believe. Now you are. <laughs> okay. I am, um, I'm gonna start off because I was so taken with everything you were talking about in stereotypes. And um, you, like all good writers, you think if you make me wonder about something I thought I understood. Um, is there anything good to stereotypes, I guess is my question. Is there any benefit to stereotypes? And we talk about cliches, for example, and everybody says you shouldn't write in cliches, but cliches are only the product of people saying something that is interesting and important over and over and over until the repetition has made it unattractive. And even um, the uh, uh, Speedy Gonzalez, nobody was rooting for the cat. The, um, uh, the, uh, he was the, um, uh, we wrote, we, we rooted for the undermouse. Um, so I guess I'm asking, is there any, without being Pollyannish about it, because I know the cruelty that stereotypes can do, is there a kind of charm or life or color that comes with them that you don't want to lose entirely? Well, we, we, we really have no choice. They're a function of, of language. We actually can't communicate without tropes. So, I mean, one of the things I write about um, in this book on these seductive hallucinations is that um, you, you, can't, you can't wish them away. You can only inoculate, inoculate yourself. They, I mean, talk about a timely metaphor. You can't, uh, you can, you cannot eliminate stereotypes, but you can inoculate yourself against their virulence. You won't need a ventilator. That's the, uh, yes, you won't yes, yes, croak. Yes. Uh, but, yeah. but that requires a significant uh, curiosity and uh, a, a, a willingness to learn. And what we have- And right a, large, now, a largeness of spirit that, that proceeds from affection, not from animosity. Well, yes, yes. And when, if there's anything our species can do really, really well, and we're seeing it now, it, it's hate. You don't have it's to hate. teach you do not have to teach a human being how to hate. You do have to teach them how to care <laughs> about, about others. So um, the, 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 if the nature of stereotypes is that they're ubiquitous and that they repeat themselves, oh, and that we derive incredible pleasure from recognizing them, because that's how, that's how our brains work, then the mm -hmm. only hope, is, and what, you know, it's what I try to do is to to interrupt them, to, uh, to uh, I don't know, alter their, their oscillation. But I was telling a friend the other day that, you know, I mean, for all the cultural critics do, I mean, let's not, uh, let's not deceive ourselves. It's almost like um, Trump et al. used Tex-Mex as a playbook. <laughs> I mean, every single trope I documented and tried to explore the origins of were just splash back in our face again as if it was the 1915 uh, again with the greaser film so it's a right. great question and of course the answer is education ah uh, and and in fact i mean with trump it was uh hopeless because it proceeded from hate and then he tried to find find images that supported it uh with more innocent more open-minded more decent people um there's there something that's called the stereotype uh, just as a uh, is one moment in a rich, wonderful culture that you embrace, and the uh, um, the horror of I remember when Trump first came aboard. The first thing he said was talking about Latino uh, rapists and uh, Mexican. Uh, imagine, He's particular Mexican. about it, you know. And, and, and most, imagine most imagine making imagine making your your polit your political stand on that. And then moving, and then we, and then I knew we were, we were cooked. <laughs> yeah. One, one reason, one reason that Write America came into being was uh, we, you know, writers are not that. Writers uh, are different and 
uh, interesting or uninteresting uh, in a variety of ways. And we, we have 135 riders in Ride America and they're all uh, different and all quite wonderful. But one thing brings them together is some desire for words to have an, an improving effect on the human mind. I wanted to tell you, Roger, that um, it, it works both ways. You know, one of the reasons that we were interested in uh, in publishing your book is I'm writing a book called uh, Igene, which is all about uh, American visual culture. And so I I was already naturally predisposed when you actually shipped us your beautiful manuscript uh, to want to do something with it if only because i can't finish my book i might as well be publishing books about seeing <laughs> and about eyes and, and especially about the i love the idea of, of the pathology of the eye that eyes mm. get sick and of course they get sick literally you had to have an operation right an intervention <laughs> but also metaphorically our eyes are filled with things we can't unsee and that traumatize yes. well said well said. Um, the question, you know, the, the idea of what does one see? What does one really see looking, uh, looking at the world? And how much does that proceed from something you want to see? And so, what, how much does it proceed from something that's really there? But I, I really hope that, the, uh, that my book, uh, which I was so glad that you liked, um, that my, my, I really hope that it didn't interrupt your book. Uh, the uh, uh, it made me just put it on ice for a couple of weeks, but uh, that I I do not want one book to shove away another. It's not. No worries. No worries. I, I I'll get it done. I have too many friends out there yelling at me. Where's your damn book, Nettie Cho? You know. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what friends are for. Friends of writers to abuse us to the point where we have to publish. I know only abuse. I know only abuse. <laughs> I'm so glad, by the way, that we have Jules uh, Jules Pfeiffer um, illustrating this book. Uh, it was just just dumb luck. I was with him on uh, an occasion, and he said that he can't he can't read anymore, um, but he can draw still. Uh, and his wonderful wife Joan um, reads to him. So I thought, well, would you be interested in that? And I described the book to him through Joan. And um, and get and send him the book, and he yes he wanted to do it, um, but the beauty of the process um, got me, and I know it gets you when you imagine the book being read to him by his wife, because he can't read it, but he can see it. Come back to seeing, he can see it, and in that wonderful rich imagination of Jules, sees other things that I never would see, and will give us those things in the book. Hey, Roger, there's a really good question for you. Uh, I'm going to read it to you from the from the chat um, from George and Anne to Roger. Uh, Roger, did you did, did you know from the get go that you wanted to write uh, this book, your book in a lyrical jazz style, which seems to us something new for you? It is. And um, this is this is George Colton. Um, <laughs> Why can't I never remember Ed's last name? The fabulous writer. Um, at any rate, shame on me. Anyway, George, uh, uh, George and Anne are also uh, dear friends, extraordinary writers, and pay attention to things closely. And um, then I'm uh, modestly, I'm glad I get the attention of such people from time to time. Um, I played piano by ear from the age of four. And I didn't get much better from the age of four to the age of 74. And uh, instead of just going along as I was going, I thought, I'm gonna take piano lessons. And Ginny, um, my wife Ginny gave me uh, piano lessons for my uh, 80th birthday. Wow. And so I started to play again. And then I actually learned, I got better. As I got better, as I learned, music started to go through my system. Again, which it hadn't before. It's it's, it's all it, it's all jazz. It's nothing, uh, nothing serious. Um, but uh, it um, uh, it was that it was that George and Ann that made me 
uh, start to write in a different way. And I started to almost play the, as it says, running the keyboard. Um, I started to write in a way that trying to simulate the music, to put the music of language uh, into, the, uh, into the mix. And then these three disparate subjects uh, came together, or I tried to make them come together in, um, in this song. I guess the book is a song. I didn't mean to stop the conversation. No, no, I was I, I I thought Alice was going to chime in. I was trying to be politely demure. The um what what I can, but you guys are really <laughs> self-propelled. You can, you know, I'm not gonna ask anything that you all wouldn't have a conversation yeah. about, but I love that from you know George and Anne and your yeah. discussion of of you, do you know that I've known Anne all life. my life, that I've taught her, and I can't think of her last name. Fathom. I tell you, there's not much time for me left. Fadiman, <laughs> thank you. Of course, it's Anne Fadiman. George Colton, Anne Fadiman. Dad was Clifton Fadiman, and she writes like an angel. And <laughs> she has a twin brother. I don't think I taught him, but oh. the um, and, I, and I've known her in my life, and I cherish her, etc. So naturally, I would forget her last name. But I want to know how you two you two met each other. Oh. How do you know each other? <laughs> do you remember? I absolutely do. We didn't. We didn't meet. The only. I mean, we meet virtually as all the world meets now. But um, uh, it, may, may I may Not I give course. my version? Sure. Um, I have a wonderful friend, Sue Cole, Susan Cole, who wrote a brilliant book, truly just staggering book, about her parents. She's she was an only child. Uh, her parents paying very. Uh, strict attention to her language as a baby, her words, every word, okay? And they made a list, which is the title of the book. They made a list. And um, I tried to take the book to big publishers or uh, in uh, in New York. Everybody said, well, you know, you, you know you're cooked when the publisher says, wonderful, brilliant, never read anything like it. They, they, instead of saying, uh, we'll offer you this. As soon as they start saying, wonderful, brilliant, et cetera, you know the end of the sentence is, but. And the but is always followed by, we can't sell it. Well, that's too bad for life, but I'll tell you, uh, this is a stunning book. And then out of the blue on her own, she said, I found a publisher and it was Bill Laricho and um, San Diego State University Press. And uh, I, um, uh, once I heard she had done that, I thought, well, um, maybe it's worth a try. And so I sent the uh, book to Bill and, and Lucky me, he uh, he took it. But I tell you, in this in this world of publishing, it's a rarity to find somebody who will take a chance with books that obviously they say won't sell, won't make a fortune, won't find a place, and God knows what they call positioning. Where uh, Bill doesn't do that. He says, "I like the book, I'll publish it." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the luxuries of, of running a, a university press with my, you know, we have a editorial board of eight of my colleagues uh, who are professors and deans here at SDSU. Um, we, one of the upsides of the university not providing us with a budget is we decide what we're going to publish. And we make those decisions based on, we'll, uh, we have over 200 books in print. Um, all our books, once they're in print, remain in print until the university uh, uh, dissolves us, which I don't think they'll do because sales are, are going crazy. <laughs> um, uh, Susan's book did incredibly well uh, and it continues to do well. And so we have the luxury of publishing books that we think are going to have a, a meaningful impact or that will, uh, in Roger's words, contribute to healing, to thoughtfulness, to intelligence. Um, and uh, that's really our, our, our rule of thumb. We, uh, we like it if we make money because that means we can publish more books, uh, but we don't need the money. We don't live for the money, though a little fame now and then would be okay for San Diego State University Press. <laughs> well, you don't know how refreshing a story that is for me to hear in this age of uh, the big five or the big six sort of gobbling up everybody else 
and we just had a conference and ended up having a big discussion about little university presses versus the big guys. And I'm, I, it, it warms my heart because the publishing industry has changed significantly in the past last five years and the last two years has had its impact. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm my, it, you've warmed my heart by hearing that. So thank you for, for all, everything you do. Um, you guys can ask each other questions again. I came in because Bill summoned me. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I guess I, 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 I did want to, um, uh, we had talked maybe about making book recommendations uh, of authors, or is that for a little later? Yes, we can we can actually ask that question now because I know that both of you have have either recently or over the course of your career dealt with up and coming authors, and not all of them have hit the radar. And I'm wondering if you couldn't tell us either someone to look out for in the future or someone that you know that is under recognized. Um, and I know that there's probably too big a list and too many friends, but I just figured I'd put that out there because it's important for us to hear names that are not necessarily easily recognizable. Uh, well, so, I'll, I'll just toss out two of, two of the most prolific uh, American writers of the 20th and 21st century happen to write comic books. And they're relatively well known. Uh, Gilbert and Jaime Hernandez, uh, who are famous for Love and Rockets. Uh, which is a comic book, but when I think Love and Rockets and the Hernandez brothers, I actually think of Charles Dickens, because what these two brothers have done from Southern California over 30, no, over 40 years is the longest piece of serialized fiction in American literary uh, history. I, I find their works, um, 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 I'm riveted by their works. I think Gilbert's works, which are focused on Latin America, mostly are more surreal, uh, where Jaime's works are more set in Los Angeles, a little bit more street, a little bit more urban, a little less surreal, but I, I love their works. And uh, the other two people who I always speak highly of are Miriam Gerba, who did quite well with her last book called Mean, and uh, another guy, a very quirky writer, uh, Salvador Plasencia, who wrote uh, The People of Paper. I'm very high on those two pieces of, of writing and I teach them regularly in my classes. People of Paper? The People of Paper, Salvador Plasencia. I'll put them in the chat. Oh, good, thank you. Good. Roger. Um, the writers that I'm reading, I, I tend to do this, are the old writers. Um, and I tend to read much more poetry than prose, uh, largely because I like to get the language and the music in my system, but also it, I tend to. it. So I've been reading Wyatt and Surrey and George Herbert um, uh, lately and rereading uh, and rereading Blake. But among the young writers, and these are writers who are just about to publish or are publishing little things now, and there will be a big thing uh, coming. And this, these were the part of the joys of teaching. I retired recently, as you know, Alice, but um, when, I was, when I was teaching, I cherished a great many uh, students who have wonderful gifts, one of whom is our own Lindsay Atkins, who is a poet of considerable uh, talent. And uh, she will publish a book uh, shortly, as will Claudia Acevedos. Claudia Acevedos uh, did this remarkable series of poems, of prose poems on the hurricanes in Puerto Rico and, um, and defined the country by its hurricanes and defined your family by its reaction to those hurricanes. Oh and it's, it's uh, stunning. And the other, another, Nicole Hebden, who was recently here, who writes this kind of gothic way, this small woman looking as innocent as can be, can scare the wits out of you. Um, and another, uh, Jillian LaRusso, um, whom I, uh, who I read with last May uh, and continues to stun me. They will all emerge 
and whether these are names you remember now, once they start to emerge, I'm, I tell you, you will remember them. Thank you. Thank you. That's always great to know names to look out for because you know sometimes you don't even know why you recognize it, but you pick it up and find out. Um, this could be for both of you because you teach, but what advice would you give to a writer working on their very first book? I was just uh, giving advice. Oh, oh go, go ahead, Roger. No, no, you go ahead. I, I, it's funny. I was just giving advice the other day. Uh, uh, one of the most common things that happens, we have students at SDSU in our MFA program and in our MA program. And it doesn't matter whether it's creative or scholarly, everybody gets a, a writer's block. So the advice I gave uh, to my mentee that she actually took, and I'm always surprised when people take my advice, um, <laughs> is if you write on a computer, get away from the computer, get yourself a fountain pen and go to a cafe and write. If you write in cafes, with your beret and your glass of wine, your cigarette, then go over to the computer. In other words, change the way you write and you might just dislodge whatever problem um, you, you, you might be having in, in executing a, a composition. Thank you. Bill was talking about the, the problem. You, you were saying, what advice do you uh, give a writer writing on a book and uh, writing a book? And inevitably the writer will come to some stop. And what Bill was suggesting is when you come to that stop, here's the way to go a, another way, which is always very helpful. I myself um, got a simple, simple minded advice. If nothing is coming to you, I, as I say in, um, in, in Cataract Blues, uh, something will come to you. But if nothing is coming, coming to you at the moment, don't write. Go for a run, take a kayak out, go for a bike ride. Do anything you can to open yourself to nature and experience. And I will tell you, and it never fails, something will come to you. It's usually an image. And an image will then, you take that image and you follow it the way Alice followed uh, the rabbit. You follow that image to another image and yet to another image and then to a thought and another thought. And suddenly you're two or three paragraphs in and you're rolling. But you have to be receptive. You have to uh, uh, be in a state of, mind and in a mood that says, I, I embrace the world. Wow, thank you. I'll keep both of them in mind. Um, I have one last question because we've hit the top of the hour. What are you each reading? What's on your nightstand? What's, what kind of books are, I'm a bookstore owner. I have to know, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I, I gave it away and I'm, I'm no help to you at all. I'm reading 17th century poets. So the, if you want to- Yeah, but okay, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> By the way, I, I forgot, forgot one contemporary writer whom I also teach, uh, who is Laura Tucker, uh, oh. who, is, who, is, who, uh, who is a devotee of this uh, program, uh, but also emerging as a, uh, a truly fine writer and finding her way through Black America into her, her own uh, gifts as a writer and bringing those gifts uh, to, uh, uh, to a, a rich, uh, expansive subject. Uh, she's lovely in person and she is a lovely writer. I'm reading uh, two things right now. I am devouring anything I can find online because I'm cheap <laughs> uh, by Mark, Mark Derry, a dear friend of mine who is a, uh, probably our, our greatest living uh, uh, cultural critic. He is he's Mark Derry, D-E-R-Y. And uh, I'm also, because I have to teach 140 pages of it tomorrow, I'm reading After Dark <laughs> uh, by Murakami, which is, uh, I think, one of his best uh, novels. It's short, sweet, eerie, and uh, televisual. It's great. After Dark. Oh, good. Good to know. Well, gentlemen, this has been a lovely evening. Thank you so much. I'm just going to mute you. I'll leave you up on the screen while I give the, give the goodbyes. And actually, I will just go ahead and let remove the spotlight so that you're not just sitting there staring at me. Folks, 
I'd like to thank Bill and Roger for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. Thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each and every Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We hope to see you next week on Monday, October 10th, as we welcome Adam Gopnik, Henry Louis Gates, and Claudia Acevedo Quinones. Please remember to check out Bird's Book's Write America page where you can find information about our upcoming episodes, see the recordings from episodes you may have missed, and maybe purchase a book or two. Good evening.